Welcome to Unethical Podcast. Someone did die in my bedroom, but happily and old. Somebody died in your house too, eh, Celeste? That's why, who cares? Yeah, but not happily and not old. And rotted. Deeply, deeply rotted. Yeah, that's kind of sad. So obviously they died alone, maybe. Or it could have been a homicide. I forgot to tell you guys a story. So this, when I was at, when I was doing my show, this girl came up to me and she was like, oh, me and my boyfriend, because I was talking about true crime with her. And she's like, me and my boyfriend in my backyard were digging something i forgot what it was but they found someone i'm not even fucking joking I, this no i need to know how it ends <laughs> rolled up carpet go back go back you said i'm not even fucking joking yeah i'm not joking this late this lady was very convincing so maybe she was horseshitting i don't know but what i do know is she told me that and her boyfriend was there so i was like confirming a uh, separate but they found a... oh fuck Hold up. But you keep freezing. You keep freezing at like the, the time where we're going to fuck. What was it? What... Richard, I'm almost there. <laughs> yeah. So she said that she, her and her boyfriend were digging in the. <laughs> Are we frozen? Yep. <laughs> no. All right. Just talk really slow. And they found a carpet, rolled up carpet. So they pull up the carpet and inside of the carpet is like a fucking bones of a human being in a fucking bag a sack and i'm like no you did not she's like yeah and then she i was like okay where are the bones show me the fucking bones then i don't believe you go would you tell the cops she's like yeah we told the cops and the cops like oh she's like yeah right you never did that and no one ever came by so i'm like where the fuck are the bones then like there's got to be bones you have to do something and this was recently she said like two months ago so and then she's like at a party so this is where i was like okay but she said at a party someone burned them all what a fucking idiot so it's been bad juju. Yeah, exactly. Bring it to the police. Don't just tell the police. But you can't burn bones. You can, but it takes a long time at, at a hot temperature. Pain Lindsay, listen, up and vanished. <laughs> yeah, it has to be like hotter than hell to burn actual bones. Yeah, for sure. I want the bones. <clears throat> but I'm, anyways, I'm following up on this. I'll give you guys more updates as this goes, because this is just a local person. It's not like I can't get a hold of them. Okay, so if it is true, they are absolutely going to go to jail for what they did. Yeah. What the fuck? They called the police. The police didn't show up. Bullshit. Bullshit. This is where the story's weird because she says her friend's a police officer. and She told him because she didn't want to get in trouble. And he's like, yeah, no, that's nothing. In trouble for what? I don't know. It's nothing. You're going to get in trouble for burning them, not finding them. I'm serious. I was like, I questioned a lot and I was convinced. <laughs> okay, well, it sounds like bullshit. And if it's not, then they've committed a crime. Oh, a huge crime. Yeah. So you said it was a creepy one today. This makes me happy, Celeste. Or a gory one or a funny one. What did you say? God damn it. I said you say it's all those things. Tragic, but morbidly funny. Oh. And I said perfect for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's not gory. That's okay. As usual. No. <laughs> we just did a really gory one. So. We definitely did. It was awesome. I'm good for now. Sid Lane from the group sent you a nice uh, outline for this. That's cool, too. I like that. She did. Nice work. Sweet. It's a good story. If you like history. Yay. I do. I do like the historical ones. They're fun. Okay. Okay, I got one quick question before we go. Is it like 1850s historical? 1919. So I always stumble into 1850s ones on private decks. It's just weird. The mid 1800s seems to be a hotbed for mystery or weird crime. <laughs> this isn't that. Okay, cool. Even better. So 1919 was supposed to be a year of celebration for the city of Boston, Massachusetts. Just two months before, on November 11th, 1918, an armistice was signed between Germany and the Allied forces, ending a bloody four-year-long war and bringing the soldiers home. Who knows what war that was? World War I. That's right. Never heard of it. <laughs> Just checking. 
what were Aussies doing in World War One? Like, were you guys part of the battle? Like, were you guys in there? We're just partying. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Yeah, West Australia is still such babies, but yes, we were. There were some Australian soldiers. Did you guys all wear shirts? You think? Were you guys showing off those abs in back then? <laughs> we were all wearing kangaroo skins. Okay, what thank do you. you. Think? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wouldn't give cotton to Australia, so too dangerous. Yeah, criminals. Yeah, that's true. There's nothing that they could do with cotton that they can't do with kangaroo skin. <laughs> there's gotta be a fucking sheep somewhere <laughs> scouring the whole entire of australia for sheep they're all in new zealand <laughs> Yeesh. take that fucking kiwis piece of shit you guys hate new zealand <laughs> right um only when we're only when we're playing them in the rugby because they always beat us <laughs> always no need to be bitter it's just rugby. No one cares, really, honestly. Yeah, I like rugby. Rugby is a good sport. That's the one with the net in your hands. Mm, no, that's lacrosse. That's lacrosse. Yeah. <laughs> rugby is <laughs> the one where really big dudes just like smash into each other at full speed with no protective gear. It's awesome. Oh, football. Oh, no protective gear. No. Protective gear. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, <Yeah>. sports ball. <laughs> so, speaking of sports balls. Uh, Just four months before, in September of 1918, the Boston Red Sox had won the World Series against Chicago 4-2. Yeah, football! (laughs) So Boston was amidst great celebration in 1919. But just two weeks into the new year, which was so full of life and promise, on January 15th, 1919, a tsunami ravaged the city. But this tsunami started on land and flooded into the ocean. Eh? What? Ooh, riddles. Thought, okay, you, you you piqued my interest. Where's my pencils? Why? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a lot of death. That's why. Well, there. Yeah. Okay. Go for it. At twelve thirty p.m., firefighters Bill Connors, Fred McDermott, Nat Browning, and Patty Driscoll were playing cards in their firehouse located next to Boston's North End docks. Across the room, fellow firefighter George Leahy and a local stonecutter, John Barry, were enjoying a pleasant lunch together. The men were suddenly startled by a loud series of rat-a-tat-tats like the sound of a machine gun firing. Or a fart. Mm. <laughs> Louder? <laughs> what was the world's loudest <laughs> fart again? 131 decibels. Okay, it could be a series of record-breaking farts. <laughs> it's not, however. At the same time, Officer Fred McManus, a patrolman for the Boston Police Department, stopped on Commercial Street at the police call box to make a call when he felt a, quote, wet, sticky substance hit his shoulder and back. Richard. (laughs) (laughs) I've been known. I know. Usually I get myself, though, when it's the pencils. (laughs) We can go. We can do it. We can. You know what? I'm, I feel attacked now because I'm not the one bringing up cum the last bunch of episodes, okay? I'm just <laughs> left with all the jizz on my face and I have to end the fucking cum joke. And I, you know what? I'll end it. Fucking spit or swallow, guys. I don't know. Keep going. Um, <laughs> he believed it to be mud. Oh. And I don't know why he, like, having mud flung at him was such a regular occurrence. I don't know if, like, drunks just threw it at him or a yeah. passing carriage or whatever but he was just like ah mud it's like 1919 there's probably not much to do except for whip mud at rich people yeah shit out a window yeah shit oh, out a yeah. window oh. absolutely yep chamber pots people throwing shit everywhere it's a possibility <sighs> i feel like if someone poured shit on you from a window you'd tell everyone it was mud you have shit on your shoulder no i don't it's mud so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well it wasn't shit or mud What he did not expect was to see a five-story high metal tank blow open like Ronnie McNutt's head and release a 40-foot high wave of deep brown destruction right at him. So he was able to escape certain death by running in between two buildings and waiting for the wave to pass before he returned to the call box. His heroic shoes somehow remaining on his feet as the wave passed. He placed the first call for aid. Quote, send all available rescue vehicles and personnel immediately, he said. 
there's a wave of molasses coming down Commercial Street. <gasps> oh, I thought it was blood. <laughs> I feel like this is not that scary though, because molasses is like there's a saying like slow as molasses. Like it's like a big tidal wave like in Austin Powers, like no. Uh, uh. <laughs> All the while running away. <laughs> Maybe it was hot molasses though. <gasps> Damn. You never you hit me up with the sexy molasses. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> The only kind. <laughs> Boil sugar. Yeah, it could have been hot. Oh. Do you guys have molasses in your house? Like, is that a thing anybody still has? I don't. I don't yes, think I do. Never. Yes, I have molasses. I use it in a bean bake that I, it's like bacon and hmm. it's called calico beans because it's like all the different colors of beans. Isn't that pretty? Throw a little, throw a little brown sugar, throw a little molasses in there, bake it up, gets all nice and stuck together. Mm. I never liked molasses. Me neither. It's bitter. I like it. Molasses cookies and shit. Blah. But this is like genuine molasses. This isn't the kind of shit you buy at the grocery store. So it probably tasted pretty good. This is 100% pure uncut molasses. This isn't that fucking street molasses you get at your local grocery store. This is pure. <laughs> the Colombian cocaine. Of yeah, I was just going to say, it's do the <laughs> same effect as uncut black tar. Mexican heroin. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'd be jumping into that wife. <laughs> Interesting molasses storm. I like it. So 2.3 million gallons of molasses <gasps> spread out in all directions, traveling <sighs> up to 56 kilometers per hour or 35 miles per hour for those sticky Bostonians. Take that, fuckheads. <laughs> Not so slow. Ugh, no, that's fast. That's terrifying, actually. <laughs> you can't really outrun that as a human. Yeah. Nope. So the monstrous metal molasses tank located at 529 Commercial Street had ruptured. With the height, the speed, and the weight behind the molasses, because it is so thick, the city didn't stand a chance. The resulting wave either swept out to sea, buried, or collapsed everything in its path. People and animals were stuck where they were, unable to retrieve themselves. And the more they struggled to free themselves, the more stuck they became. Like flies on flypaper. Oh, God. Oh, God. It's such a shitty way to die. <laughs> like, Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> fuck. I know, right? Richard is, like, embodying exactly what I said. Tragic but weirdly funny. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they're being mean to me again. Shocking. This is 1919. Remember that there's no cars either. There are no oh, Honda yeah. Civics to take rest, to take refuge, refuge in there. And all the engines have four legs. Yep. There would have been cars around. No, not in 1919. It would have been rare if there were, cause I think cars were invented around that time. Right. You could rent like town cars. Yeah. Although yeah. I don't know if that's true in Boston. Oh. Yeah, there, it would have been more carriages, though, anyway, because uh, when I was doing What's His Nuts, Edgar Allan Poe, that's what I, I was trying to figure out if there'd be cars around then, but very rare. But yeah, yeah imagine the horses, too. You're even trying to get away on a horse. Yeah, you're like, get, and the horse just gets stuck. Oh, God, it's even worse. Like, I don't care if you lose a car in a fucking molasses accident, but you're losing your horse, too. It'd be like a never-ending story. No! <laughs> I wasn't ready for this. Artax! I saw that at the movies when it came out. I was a little kid and it scarred me for life. That, that scene. movie's actually like terrifying. I wasn't ready. No. I'm going to watch that with the kids. You should. <laughs> so how did the guy like, uh, he said he went down an alley to hide from it. Yeah. So like the molasses didn't go down the alley? Like how No, did... think of it like, okay, so it's like two like, like, I don't know, like brownstones, like brick buildings. He goes in between uh -huh. two of them into like the narrow little alleyway where Jack the Ripper would like be murdering people. Picture that. And then um, like the wave passed by the buildings because mm. they were made of brick. Gotcha. Like it would be perpendicular to where the, the, the road would be perpendicular from the flow yeah. so it wouldn't go down the hallway. But it was so narrow. There's so little. Yeah. There's so much resistance to the flow. He, yeah, okay. I get it now. No. Yeah. He was actually in a very fortunate position 
because uh, like very few of the buildings were actually made of brick. Yeah. Just imagine watching everyone just get stuck like fucking live traps for bu- for like just watching the distance. The guys in their top hats being like, I cannot get my feet untethered. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really like, good Boston accent. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah. Boston. Yeah. I, I'm good at accents. Have you not noticed? Mm-hmm. All right. So. Let's get into some stories. Anthony and Maria Distasio were walking with a group of children collecting scraps of firewood near the molasses tank. Unfortunately for them, they were in the direct path of the disaster about to strike. So Maria disappeared under the wave, but Anthony drifted by his home on top of it. He somehow just sort of floated by on his chest. <laughs> Aerodynamics. Yeah. Or molasses dynamics. I don't know. The quote from the um the witness was like, uh, he rode the wave on his crest. <laughs> <laughs> like free Willy. <laughs> I'm king of the world. <laughs> like, dude, like a uh anyway, but anyway. So so he drifted by his house and he could hear his mother calling. His mother is watching from her front porch, like in horror, screaming for him. And then she said he finally went under the wave. Oh, I thought this was going to be our like sailor all the way to the coast. Like, yeah, I I followed the sun. No, <sighs> he didn't make it to the ocean. Damn. Free Willy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> A free Willy with an alternate ending where he just flops onto the thing when he's trying to jump over. Like, oh, <laughs> right on to the, the little kid. <laughs> and died. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Both siblings were actually thought to have died, but while the family was at the makeshift morgue to identify them, Anthony opened his eyes and saw his mother and three of his sisters. Uh, Unfortunately, Maria wasn't one of those faces. She had perished in the disaster along with her school chum, 10-year-old Pasquale and Tosa. So they ended up the youngest among the dead. At first, authorities were certain that the youngest to die was five-year-old Albert Giancy, who was missing for several hours after he was swept off his feet and dragged away from his family. But during the cleanup process, young Albert was found hungry, but completely unharmed. Hmm. Oh, good. The like, wow. kids probably the kids probably went towards this like finally because they didn't have candy and shit back then. This was their candy, right? So it's like, mm. finally, my dreams come true. And then just the kids survived by eating his way out or you know they probably wanted to eat this <laughs> a five-year-old eating his way out of a 40-foot wave of molasses mm. but he said he was hungry he said he was hungry he was probably just small enough where he could just walk through it just really slowly hey yeah. wait sorry let me get the dimensions that i get you just said 40 foot is it, it's a 40 foot fucking wave is that what you said yeah the highest peak was 40 feet that's so crazy yeah do you think houses had like molasses insurance around that plant or do you think they all got Uh fucked after they all got fucked after well not exactly they we'll we'll get into it yeah we'll get into it all right so uh the clarity home was knocked off its foundation with four inhabitants inside martin clarity a local club owner was sleeping after a long night at the club when he was suddenly swept upon the wave in his bed So he remained above the molasses sea until the wave had passed and then the molasses had settled. He managed to pull his brother and his sister from the wreckage, but he found no sign of his mother. Later, a neighbor came to tell him that they had found his mother. Bridget Clarity had been just outside the house when the blast came, and according to the investigators, the force of the blast had created a vacuum so forceful that it dragged houses right off their elevations, causing them to fall in a pile of wreckage in the street. So unfortunately for Bridget, she was crushed by her own home as it crumbled in the street. Martin's brother, Stephen, though he had been rescued, eventually became another victim of the incident. He was institutionalized because of the trauma and he died in the asylum. The molasses, it's coming for me. It's okay, Tommy. That was years ago. The molasses is never going to (laughs) stop. I can relate. (laughs) That was a very accurate depiction. (laughs) Nothing sticky for him yeah i just want toast no honey no molasses on the toast <laughs> they put syrup on his pancakes and he fucking freaks out yeah. <laughs> what is that oh <laughs> <Poor thing. laughs> 
I just, I felt really bad for him then. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> <Aww. laughs> yes, he was terrified about the molasses. Imagine being inside when that thing's smashing through the buildings. You're like in a basement. You just see like your window seeping just slowly fucking molasses dripping down. Like, what the fuck is going on outside? You can't even open the door to check because it's just molasses in. Like that shitty horror movie, The Blob. Yeah. I don't say shitty when it comes to The Blob. That movie's amazing. Oh, no, it's incredible, <laughs> but it's shit. <laughs> it's brilliant, but it's, it's crap. <laughs> it's purposely made like shit for sure. Absolutely. I always identified with The Blob. Us older people grew up when there was like only eight movies made a year. So we had to think some of them were good. Now there's like a fucking thousand made a year. And you can tell you're yeah. like, now that movie's shitty. But it's like, yeah, but 1984, that movie was like groundbreaking. Have you ever seen Ooze Absolutely. like that back then? Yeah. No, didn't think so. Now you can make Ooze like probably in 10 minutes. My kid could probably make some sort of Ooze fucking graphic. And it was yep. like the fun cafe looking setting, you know, yeah. so it was like fun. Yeah. It was a fun horror movie. <laughs> yeah. Of toxic fucking waste <laughs> that grows each time it consumes a body. Yep. It's much like me. Wait. Tally's actually 18 feet tall. We just don't know it because it's behind a camera. <laughs> 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 I've eaten four people, guys. You didn't know? Yeah, you don't know the dimension of this room. <laughs> oh, that's dangerous. That makes Tally Richards type. Oh. Richard, I can fight. Yeah, I bet you can. You're 18 fucking feet tall. <laughs> <laughs> you don't even have to fight. You just step on him. Just kick yeah. him. Just punt him right into the sun. Richard wants to do something. This is what I like, though. Keep doing it more. You know what Fuck I mean? <laughs> I guess I'll just bury you in a hole because then I can just scoop up a big chunk of dirt. Just pick him up by his tiny little head like a melon. Part of the kink. Oh, Swing you around a little bit like bears do. Mm. Yeah. Break your neck. Yeah. Now I have to jerk off. Fuck. <laughs> please turn your camera off are you guys watching because that helps yeah exactly <laughs> the fact that you guys aren't turning me off is turning me on you know what i mean <laughs> you goddamn sadist they're keeping me around i'm so aroused <laughs> <laughs> i can only get so erect <laughs> What what other person did this molasses kill? Um, I will tell you. <laughs> a few more. At the firehouse, two hosemen, Gillespie and Gregory, were able to escape by leaping out of windows before the building collapsed. Inside, Nat Browning and Bill Connors were pulled out with little injuries, but Patty Driscoll and Fred McDermott were rushed to the hospital. So once these men were extricated from the sticky mess of the fire hall, efforts turned to finding the missing man on duty, George Leahy. They heard sounds of a man trapped at the rear of the building and proceeded to cut an escape tunnel with a metal cutting torch into a huge steel plate from the molasses tank that had fallen into the building. So once they were through, they found that it wasn't Leahy at all. It was the stone cutter, John Barry. Leahy was later found trapped under a pool table covered in so much debris that getting him out was nearly impossible. So he was given morphine and whiskey, but once a doctor and an army surgeon arrived, they announced that he had died. Uh, he may have survived, if not for the firehouse ironically catching on fire during the search for him, dividing the efforts of the rescue team inside. Yeah, fire Firehouses were different back then, though. It wasn't as, like, advanced as it is now, you know, like... Are you implying that all firehouses are fireproof now? No, what I'm implying is that like, okay, first of all, they couldn't fucking see a molasses fucking storm coming their way, so that alone, right? But they weren't like, they didn't have like engine, fire engines to push, like hose out shit. Like they would bring bunches of water to places and like hose it that way. You know what I mean? They would go fill up their tank at a lake or something and then make their way there. It's not like they had it. Anyways, it's not the same as it is now. We have water on tap, fill it up and go. Yeah. Well, no, they had they had carriages like wagons that had a water tank and they would fill buckets and they'd use sand more than they would use water to put out fires. But uh, yeah, yeah, it really divided the team. Yeah, so I mean, nowadays, a thing would start on fire. They put it out pretty quickly inside of a firehouse, assuming that it's a modern enough fire. It wouldn't be like the 1919. Jesus Christ. Buckets and carriages. Jesus. Yeah. No fire hydrants on every corner or every other corner. No, I had to hitch up the wagon and 
off they go. But at the time, it would be like everyone in the neighborhood would come out and fight the fire, not just the fire. The That's firemen. true. Yeah. Is molasses flammable? I don't think so. It's sugar, right? Like, yeah, I don't think it would be, but it could just get it get turned into deeper, darker molasses if it boiled, right? It would be make it like lava. Oh my god, it's fucking magma inside the firehouse. Jesus Christ. Yeah, that's what it is. It's like fucking lava, unpenetrable lava. It Fuck doesn't, that. it won't catch fire until it reaches 999 degrees Fahrenheit. But even then, I don't, th- I think that's stagnant because it would be like moving roller. If it was sitting in a spot, yeah, for sure. You could just fire a torch on it for a long amount of time, get it on fire. But I don't think that's, since everything was just, I don't know how, fa- like it said it was going 50 kilometers, but by the time it, it had to have slowed down. Jesus. Was it a warm day? Yeah. It was January, so oh okay. Not particularly. Let's say imagine that going out into a hundred degree day or whatever in Celsius. So right next to the molasses tank was an elevated railroad track. So by some miracle, a train that was passing just seconds after the initial blast managed to stay on the rails as they were destroyed beneath the wheels. So once the train was past the damage, Royal Albert Lehman, the engineer, brought it to a full stop. He knew that trains came past this track every seven minutes. And so he sprinted to the guard shack where he told the railroad worker to stop the southbound train. And he ran up the northbound track to stop the northbound train. So he stood on the track. He waved his arms. He shouted frantically. And he could see he was close enough to the train that he could see that the engineer couldn't hear him. But he stayed on the track. He stayed there jumping and flailing until the screech of the brakes relieved him of his panic. This is coming. The molasses is coming. Like, shut the fuck up, Frank. Shut the fuck up. We just want to do our job. The molasses. The molasses is okay, not coming. Okay, Paul This is such a funny... That's, it's just such a funny, uh, like, idea of the guy yelling at molasses. And everyone's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> Why are you scared of the sugary syrup, man? <laughs> Calm down. Uh, I love this natural disaster. This isn't natural. Yeah. I'm natural. I love this disaster. Sure. Unnatural disasters. That's what this episode is going to be called. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) Unnatural. Uh, So yeah, the engineer he comes, he opens the door, he gets out of the train, and he's fucking pissed. He's going to be like, "Albert, you fucking asshole!" But Lehman shouted to him, "Quote: You can't go any further. The goddamn molasses tank burst." (laughs) That'll do it. (laughs) Our greatest fear imagined. Uh, we've been planning for this for six months. <laughs> <laughs> he takes like a duffel bag with a fucking arsenal out of his fucking train, puts on face paint, runs into the ocean. Like Operation 10 Ton Sponge. <laughs> Move out. <laughs> if only. If only. Oh, God. There was one guy that warned the entire place. I guarantee it. He, there was a guy that sat in the board up. This, this tank's going to explode one day. They're like, okay. There was actually. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> I've been warning them for 10 years. He's the guy walking down the middle of the middle of the street with the fucking sandwich board on. <laughs> no, but there was the a, end is nigh. There was a guy. <laughs> there was a guy. Yeah, there was a, a guy, an oracle. Was this like one of like a series of large tanks or did they just say like we're building one giant tank? tank and yeah. that'll store all the molasses we're ever gonna need and sell <laughs> and they're like that's that's crazy that's way too expensive than, <laughs> you know building a bunch of little ones no i want a giant <laughs> how many million gallons did you say 2.3 yeah and how much molasses does one little town need it's not for the town we'll get into it it's boston okay. too it's not little sorry <laughs> Well, Boston in 1919 wasn't that large. It was a it was a lot bigger than a lot of other cities, mm. but in 1919 it was that was this big, <laughs> about the size of a pencil. But the wave courteously <laughs> remained within the confines of Boston, and that's why it was so high. That's, that is, you're right though, Steve. Like 2.3 million gallons, like that'll fit the 2.3 million we need. <laughs> the tank was five stories high, and actually, I I. I'll tell you the measurements in a little while here. So uh, the railroad worker was able to stop the southbound train as well. So there were no injuries or casualties on the rail line. Sadly, 
Same cannot be said for the city paving department building directly across from the tank. Nearly every person inside was killed and those that weren't killed were badly hurt. So those are just some of the stories that families experienced during that tragic day, but that will account for all of the deaths. So, so what do we get? What was the total on that? Before we get into the deaths, I just want to tell you there is a little happy story inside the wreckage. Uh-huh. While they were cleaning up, under the Clarity House, rescuers found a little miracle in the form of a very friendly and completely unharmed kitten. Ah, uh, Meow. I, I thought it was going to be two people got stuck together and they fell in love. Um, <laughs> I wish it did. They only survived by making out. <laughs> Lick it off me. Lick it off me. We've got to stay warm. Suck it out of my mouth. Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah, for me, CPR on people would be weird. <laughs> now you're talking my language, though. Like, like there's, like, mouth. no way for them to throw up molasses. Mm. Like, if you give someone CPR, it's not a matter of if they throw up, it's when. So just be prepared. Yummy. No, thank you. My first aid expired. I'm not allowed to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good not being able to help in times of crisis. Thank you. I gotta do it every year. I'm just not good at standing around. So, <laughs> Christy, I'm sure you've been puked on like 500 times. Um, I've had every form of bodily fluid on me at some point at work. Gross. In my personal life, you know. Yeah, <laughs> at most. I'm saving some for Jesus. <laughs> Got a little spot right here just for him. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So who wants to know how many people died? I do. Yes, please. Okay. 333. No. 16. 666. Oh, I'll say 10. 2000. No. All wrong. Richard was closest. Oh. So by the time... All that remained was a curb high pool of thick, sweet, fragrant syrup. 21 people had died, and 150 people were seriously injured. By molasses? Or I guess by the shit that came in with them all, like the debris. I was like, <laughs> no, some people were straight up killed by molasses. You don't have molasses in your house. Go buy some molasses and actually like hold it in your hand. It is unbelievably thick. Oh, no. The thi- I get what molasses is, and I understand that you could totally choke on it and die, no problem. But like seriously injured was my problem, not the death. I don't know. I think going 56 clicks an hour, like it would be like hitting a wall. Oh, for sure. I guess so. Yeah. I wasn't even thinking of that. So the disaster that would become known as the Great Boston Molasses Flood had begun just over three years earlier. In 1915, the United States Industrial Alcohol Company decided to take advantage of the huge demand for molasses during the Great War, which would later be known as World War I. So they requisitioned the construction of a massive holding tank on the Boston Harbor, which would be in proximity to both the molasses ships coming into the harbor from Cuba and the West Indies, as well as the elevated railroads supporting the train cars that would move the molasses to the processing plants. The tank was built by the Purity Distilling Company, a subsidiary subsidiary of the USIAC. And it would be used to store molasses until it could be transported and converted into ethanol. So molasses, most commonly known for its use in baking, is also the basis of rum. But in 1915, it was becoming extremely valuable in the processing of munitions because of the war in Europe. Because of its role within the the munitions trade, the Purity Distilling Company was quick to attribute the disaster to an attack by anarchists protesting the war in Europe. So prior to the incident, a police station not far from the tank had been bombed, and throughout the rest of 1919, anarchists sent booby-trapped packages to prominent figures all over the United States. In 1920, anarchists executed the Wall Street bombing, which led to the death of 38 people. And so it was, a conven- it was convenient that the company had a readily available scapegoat. But the public would not be fooled. That tank had a history, a well-documented and prophetic one. Hmm. So anarchists were running rampant around the states, uh, blowing shit up. And Nothing's not- changed. Okay. Yeah, I guess so. That's true. I, I hmm. Molly, Molly just texted me. Can I come say hi to the girls? Yes, uh-huh. you can, Molly. His Aww. kids like us now. It only took six months. Yeah. 
The just last time that. she talked to us, she's just like, those girls are weird. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just, I talked to her it. and I said, why'd you do that? She's because I didn't hear what she, you guys said to her. She just said, oh, you look like oh. your dad. So she was like, Ugh, I didn't say that. I said weird. you're prettier than your dad. <laughs> oh, whatever. That's a low bar. Yeah. <laughs> it's a low bar. I'm not very pretty. So they were using molasses to make bullets? Uh, ethanol. To make, uh, yeah. Fuel. There you go. But what were they using it in the munitions trade? How were they using it? Bombs in particular. Yes, that makes sense. I'm like, so they were making molasses. They were making molasses bullets. How do they? <laughs> That's where my brain went. <laughs> they weren't using the fuel. They were using the molasses to make. <laughs> yeah, they cooked it down to solid pieces. Oh. It's fireable. I tell you what. Sure is. Mm. It explodes like nobody's business. Would that be like the byproduct from like refining it, I guess? Yeah, it needs to be processed down into ethanol. Huh. Yeah, science. Yeah, Mr. Hey, White. Mr. White. <laughs> <laughs> science, bitch. <laughs> I see. I gotcha. I, it took me a while. So the man who was put in charge of the tank building project, his name was Arthur P. Gell. He needed the structure built in a hurry to take advantage of the rising need for munitions. All in all, it took two months to lay the foundation and build the massive structure. The tank was 50 feet tall, the height of a five-story building, 90 feet in diameter, and 242 feet in circumference. It would hold a maximum of 2.3 million gallons of molasses. It's like a giant soda can. Big boy. That is insane. Huge That's... tank. <laughs> <laughs> like, why wouldn't they just make multiple yeah. smaller tanks like a normal fucking distillery? Because they save money on real estate that way. Ah, oh, sons of bitches. That's how Chernobyl blew up, too. That's why all the new developers build up, not out. Like, I feel like molasses was probably more important back then because of all this ethanol business i didn't really realize i thought it was just like for baking really so yeah well before munitions it was rum yeah also rum right that's important very important to that was a mm-hmm. massive massive uh trading market back then that's that's why pirates are so closely associated with rum because it was really easy to make from molasses right huh. pirates good old jack sparrow and it tastes good fuck yeah I never would have thought mm-hmm. the the molasses thing was that important. Like I'm a, it's interesting to me. I'm gonna have to look that up later. Yeah, it's weird in our modern society, right? How things used to have such insane value. Yeah, there's certain things that didn't have any value until we made it valuable, like like aluminum. You know, pineapples used to be so expensive that people would rent them for parties to look like they're they were wealthier than they are. <laughs> they would rent what uh... pineapples. <laughs> okay hey guys see my pineapple i remember when i was a kid when a pineapple first came up you remember steve where we lived there was never pineapples until like i remember my dad used to work in food distribution back in the day and we got i remember getting a not a pineapple per se but a, a pomegranate and all of us gathered around the table with a pomegranate be like what is this little poppy thing inside Ooh, this is a delicious <laughs> treat like it was so rare you had the same like you just had apples and bananas you know you didn't really have the variety of food we have now so yeah. i could see that like I, I i wouldn't rent a fucking pineapple to look like from the caribbean or something but like i have a pineapple but we can't eat it <laughs> yeah don't eat this this is a fifty thousand dollar fruit you eat this fucking thing you're dead we're I'm all dead. eating you with it <laughs> I mortgaged the house for this fucking pineapple. My friend has a my friend has a lime tree and she was like showing me, you know, she's like, this is the lime. And it's like as tiny as a little pebble or like pea size, you know. And I was like, man, that's crazy. Can you believe that like in just a couple months that thing's gonna be big enough where you chuck it at someone and it's gonna hurt? <laughs> <laughs> that's what it, uh, limes are used for now for sure. Mm-hmm. yeah tequila and throwing at people <laughs> definitely i definitely would have thought that you would go with can you believe that that's going to be sliced up and put in my drink put in my corona yeah, no. like, you can chuck it at someone <laughs> to be fair you can chuck anything at someone if you believe in yourself true 
I had an apple tree and that's mainly what I used them for was uh, throwing them at raccoons. <laughs> oh, I was going to say you had siblings, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Did you throw any at Richard? No, I don't think so. Oh, we had a we had a crab apple fight like two years ago with our kid with our oh, my kid. Oh, that's right in the park. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we had a huge crab oh. apple fight. Oh sure. yeah, that was good. <laughs> Smoked some kids. Yeah. yeah, and they all love it too. Like, ow again. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they completed construction of the tank in December of 1915, with just three days to spare before the first shipments of molasses were expected to arrive from Cuba. So unlike today, welding was not a technology that was used to add strength and stability to large metal objects such as holding tanks. The tank was built by bending massive half-inch thick steel sheets and bolting them together using thousands of rivets. So that was the rat-a-tat-tat-tat sound, all of the rivets failing. Oh my god. That's crazy. That's really not a good design at all because there's so many fucking holes. I bet they didn't even go through it to check for leaks. <laughs> we'll get into it. So from the very first day, witnesses said that the tank leaked small amounts of molasses at the seams. Now, they weren't saying it like it was necessarily a bad thing. The local children like Anthony and Maria Distasio would often go over to the tank with sticks and make themselves little like lollipops out of the molasses that was leaking from the tank. Uh, in fact, it's possible that that is why they were there that day so close to the tank. Molasses also dried quite quickly, and uh, it would it would become a somewhat sturdy texture when it was dried. And so you can imagine how that must have been for the people that were trapped in it once it started to dry. Uh, women in the area would also fill up jars of molasses from the tank and use it in their cooking and baking. So life was actually pretty good for three sweet, sticky years. Thanks for saying it like that. Mm hmm. So the neighborhood kook, as, as Richard mentioned, was a man named Isaac Gonzalez. He was actually the caretaker of the tank. So he began to tell Arthur Gell in, the mid, in mid-1918 that the tank was making groaning noises and that the rate that the riveted seams leaked was increasing. Arthur told Isaac to do his job, cock the leaking areas, and if he said anything to anyone, he would be looking for a new job. So in preemptive fucknuttery, Arthur also ordered the tank to be painted dark reddish brown the color of molasses to disguise the leaking molasses okay sorry i i'm just curious and this is a real question what did they use for caulking back then like they don't have caulking guns like are they just jamming it full of hay or something like the i'll tell you what they didn't do they didn't weld it <laughs> <laughs> i just find that interesting they have caulk of some sort like what is that like mm. just clay are they just jamming clay around do we know no we don't know just Google cock from 1919. <laughs> I don't want to say cock from 1919. It's, it's just the bottom of that guy, that fisty cuffs guy, just naked with just a bang. <laughs> <laughs> wax. Wax? Yeah, they would use wax. That makes sense. That wouldn't have helped because the molasses is, oh God. The molasses is what? It's hot. Well, it's like warm and so it would have just melted the wax. Whatever. That shit just gave me a headache, honestly. Knowing they shoved wax in there, like, oh yeah, give me your em half empty candles. We'll figure it out. It was sealing wax. It wasn't candle wax. Oh, gotcha. Okay. That makes more sense. Just like hair removal wax is different from candle wax. It's different. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Although you could wax yourself with candle wax. I don't recommend it though. I bet you can wax yourself with molasses. Actually, yeah, you definitely could. It would dry like yeah. to just the right texture. I'm not trying it. No way. You're the only one here who waxes. If anybody does this, message the group. Richard, let me wax your butthole with molasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, partner. Whatever you say, you're responsible for my butthole hair. We figured this out last episode. So. Well, I want to use molasses now. <laughs> Whatever you think's proper for my butthole, I can't question your job, your ethics. And... Thank you yeah. for your consideration. Richard's just the spreader. At least it's a natural product. <laughs> yeah, all natural waxing. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make sure it's warm. Well, it mm. has to be to go on there. Silly goose. Gotta slick it on there somehow. So, um, <laughs> Isaac became so concerned with the conditions of the tank that he had taken to running more than two miles across Boston in the middle of every night just to check the joints. 
His midnight sprints were often triggered by vivid nightmares of the tank bursting and swallowing the streets while he looked on in horror. Before long, he would simply spend his nights in the shack next to the tank, waiting for any sign of the monstrous collapse. Isaac said one night, though, that when he was holed up in the shack, the phone rang and an anonymous man told him that the tank would be blown up with dynamite. Uh, As I mentioned about the political climate at the time, it didn't seem like an unrealistic threat. Isaac then decided it wasn't safe for him to sleep there anymore in case there was an attack, but he couldn't let it go. So he would go, he went back to running across town every night and he would spend 10 minutes draining molasses into the harbor in an effort to release the gases that were building up inside. Oh, he's burping it. Yes, he is. Yes. So he's trying to reduce the load on the flimsy rivets. He eventually ended up quitting his position in November of 1918. That was the same year that the, or the same month that the war ended, whether that had anything to do with it, he never mentioned. Uh, All he said was that he couldn't live with himself knowing what was going to happen and knowing that there was nothing that he could do about it. So based on this, the short timeline between when he quit and when the disaster struck, it's possible that without his efforts, it would have happened a lot sooner. He sounds like a smart man with very little power on, you know, behind Mm -hmm. him. Like he has no choice. All the neighborhood kooks are, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that and like, you, this is typical of like big companies, right? The guy working the job would know a lot more than the people just making the money off of this giant tank. But, and he probably warned them. They're like, yeah, but more money. And then he's like, yeah, but die. And they're like, yeah, yeah, but more money. And this guy's having actual nightmares of what's about to come. So yeah. he absolutely knew it was wrong. Yeah. yeah. Especially when he's burping it in the middle of the night because the fucking top could blow off at any time. It's like making fucking hooch. It's realistic to assume that the that Arthur Gell knew that uh, it wasn't safe. I yeah, he didn't like he didn't research the company that built it or that built it or pick it based on anything except for sort of word of mouth, I guess. Um, apparently, what he said, and I don't know exactly what this means, but what he said was that the company told him that they had previously built structures that were still standing with a safety rating of two. I don't know what that means. He said, we will build this with a safety rating of three. And Arthur Gell was like, three is bigger. All right. (laughs) A a safety rating is generally like if it's a load to take like a thousand pounds, you use a safety rating of like 1.5. So you build it to 1500 pounds, right? So it's like a construction term. So they're saying like instead of two times, the load will make it for three times. But Oh, oh, I see. Okay. It's a safe. That makes rating. sense. Okay. okay. Well, that's what he told him. And I, Arthur Gell didn't know what that meant either, I assume, because he was just like, yeah, okay, that's a bigger number. <laughs> Let's go with but that. It would, be, it would be safer though, right? Well, it wasn't. It's one of those things too, where it was 1919. I don't know how they're measuring the weight of molasses back then, right? So it probably was a lot of guesswork. They probably went like, if one pound of this is in this square cube of then this has to be that but it might not be the same because it's so fucking much right like it compresses on itself and it would make it way more heavy i don't think so i I think he just picked this contractor because they were the cheapest they used the cheapest materials Mm -hmm. but this is what he said in court to be like no i had no idea capitalism gotcha (laughs) yeah capitalism a long and sorrowful legal battle ensued. It was one of the longest in American history, and it was the largest class action lawsuit in Boston up to that time, with 119 plaintiffs combined into one suit. So the man who took their case was Damon Everett Hall, and on the opposing side, representing the company, that's the United States Alcohol Industrial Company or Industrial Alcohol Company, uh, that man was Charles Francis Choate, which is pretty close to Choate. I'm just saying. I thought that's where you were going. And I, was I was gonna, gonna laugh. Yeah. <laughs> so consolidating the cases into one lawsuit was partly out of necessity uh, because the courtroom was not large enough to accommodate 119 cases, but it also gave Choate an advantage in that the witnesses were there to represent 119 plaintiffs, meaning that one bad witness could ruin all 119 claims, not just one. So each side presented their case to an auditor, and then the auditor would make up a report which would be given to the Supreme Court of Massachusetts, and they would determine if it would be pursued in a civil trial. The defense strategy was to convince the auditor that the disaster could only have been caused by a dynamite blast and therefore an attack. 
So they used recreations of explosions with replica tanks and expert witnesses to build their narrative. But this strategy was quickly stamped out when the police chemist Walter Wedger was cross-examined by Damon Hall. Wedger confessed that nowhere among the wreckage did they find any debris or scrap or particle that could be linked to an explosive. The defense did have one eyewitness testify, and she said that she had seen smoke rising from the tank before the blast sent her flying. But when Hall questioned her about whether the smoke could have been coming from any of the industrial structures nearby, she became very irate and left the witness stand in a fury unprompted by the court. Oh, can't do that. Nope, can't do that. Why are they fighting so hard against it being an attack or uh, an accident? Just because, like, I'm talking about the witnesses. I'm not talking about the company. I get that. But, like, what do you care if it's an attacker? Like, why would you make that? Like, it's not, maybe it's not made up, but why would you get so mad? That's what I'm trying to say. They probably paid him. Yeah. Sometimes uh, companies are unethical, Richard, and they try to bribe people to do things. Ah, you said the show name in the movie. No, he said, he said the title. He said the title in the show. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I see what you did there. It's a big world out there, Rich. There's a lot of. A lot of bad people. (laughs) (laughs) So uh, Damon Hall, of course, had many of his own eyewitnesses who all reported that the tank leaked, the tank frequently vibrated, the tank groaned under the stress on the rivets. And they also had testimony from Isaac, who told the court that he had been threatened with the loss of his job if he spoke out about his fears. Good boy. So in a particularly cold and despicable move, Chode argued that the company should not be liable for the deaths of Maria D'Astasio and Pasquale Ian Tosca. Those are the two 10-year-olds. Because they had been trespassing near the tank at the time of the rupture. He also argued that those who succumbed to molasses asphyxiation probably died quickly and didn't suffer. So the monetary compensation for pain and suffering should be lower for them. Oh, my God. <laughs> Lawyers. Such a cocksucker. <laughs> so it was ultimately determined uh, in the uh, in the auditor's report that the company, or not in the, whatever, it was ultimately determined that the company heads at Purity Distilling Company used substandard equipment from the very beginning. The steel plates that they were using for the wall of the tank were only half as thick as they should have been. The rivets were not of necessary strength to maintain the integrity of the tank under maximum capacity, and it was never tested to see if it could hold the amount of molasses that it was designed to hold. In fact, uh, because of the short timeline between the completion of construction and the arrival of the molasses ships, the only testing that was conducted consisted of filling it with six inches of water to be sure that it wouldn't leak, which it did anyway. Oh. Oh, God. Six inches, never good enough. I don't know. In a <laughs> tank that big, six inches of water would be like a lot of, of water. I imagine it would take a long time to fill it up that much. Yeah, but it's also like a fucking 40 foot like thing. Like you're not, it's all relative to the size of it. If it was a foot, the tank, yeah, six inches would be awesome. But no, it's a fucking 50 foot tank. That's they only nothing. had three days, man. What do you want from them? Ingenuity, uh-huh. you know? And molasses weighs so much more than water, I'm sure sure does yeah but water would be more likely to leak because it's less dense that's true so the testimony was all heard over the course of three years 920 witnesses took the stand and 1584 exhibits were entered into evidence the court auditor hugh ogden compiled a 51 page report which he submitted to the superior court of massachusetts The USIAC's claims of sabotage were dismissed outright, and in total, Ogden recommended $300,000 in damage. 300, Jesus fucking Christ. Ogden recommended $300,000 in damages, which is about $30 million today. The city of Boston should be awarded $25,000 or $2.5 million for the Department of Paving Buildings. Um, and the elevated railroad company should be given 42000 or $4.2 million for the damage to the tracks. The remainder of the damages should be divided up between the plaintiffs based on their situations. Those who died instantly should be awarded the least, such as Bridget Clowardy, Maria D'Astasio, and Pasquale Ian Cantos- e- fucking and Pasquale Ian Tosca. Those who died after several hours, such as George Leahy, should be awarded a little more. And those who were injured but survived, such as Martin Clowardy, should be awarded the most. Do you ever notice how the uh, 
Spanish sounding last names were the ones they said get less money. Anyways, weird. How Funny that... how that works. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that works. Yes. Well, the Spanish caretaker was also the one that they were shitting all over. So. Yeah, I, I'm not shocked. I'm just pointing it out that I've yeah. noticed. Yeah. In 19... case listeners can't hear this, I just rolled my eyes. Like you should be able to hear that. Yeah, uh, 1919. I'm watching you, you son of a bitch. Boston actually had a massive Italian population, so it's possible that these people are actually Italian. It sounds Italian or like Portuguese or something. Pasquale. I don't know if we were very nice to Italians right off the bat, either. No, I don't think we were. There's slurs for them too. They're just whiter, so they got away. They got to blend in better, quicker. Uh, Ogden said those who lost their houses should be awarded additional money for the house. Generally, those affected would receive anywhere from a few hundred dollars up to twenty five hundred dollars more if they'd lost their homes as well. Stephen Clardy, the man who died in the asylum, he was ruled ineligible for compensation. Why? No, this is not going to pay me. He didn't die on the day of the disaster. (laughs) Oh, so mental trauma doesn't qualify as. Okay. No, he had cool. molasses PTSD, um, and they didn't know what PTSD was back then, so they just called it's him called M PTSD. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was post traumatic molasses disorder. There you go, PTMD. <laughs> um, Ogden also recommended that the case be taken to trial. However, the USIAC company privately agreed to the terms Ogden had already laid out, but they would pay double of each sum if they avoided a trial, and so that is what they agreed to. All the remains of the disaster now are faded brown tide lines on the windows of old buildings and positive and permanent changes to building regulations around the country. But for years, if not decades, the smell of molasses lingered in streets and basements. Some say on warm days, they can still smell it. The site where the tank was has now been converted into a baseball field where a plaque sits at the entrance in commemoration of the disaster. So there's a plaque left. They really should have started with a baseball field. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Le- Leroy got Leroy fucking New York gets a whole Jello museum after Jello catastrophe. I would like a molasses museum. That's all. I want to see pictures. I want to see like mm-hmm. I-, I would like to go to Boston and be able to go like into a building where there's like this is the kind this is how viscous molasses is and you get to stick your hand in Corona filled molasses now, you know. Uh, I think part of the agreement with the six hundred thousand dollars in damages was probably that they wanted this swept under the rug. Yep, make it go away. So they should pardon that molasses posthumously, like they do with everything else. <laughs> the molasses wasn't found guilty. <laughs> <laughs> we know it wasn't your fault, gentle creature. <laughs> <laughs> Did they talk about like how hard it was to get molasses off of like yourself or things? Everything. They said that for months, everything you touched in Boston was sticky. Yeah. So like, imagine like if you were waist deep in molasses, everything would be stuck to itself. You would be fully waxed. You'd have to free your ass cheeks first. Yes. So you'd just have all these people (laughs) just furiously scrubbing their asses to get them open again. Yes. That's true. Oh. <laughs> oh, I imagine it, there was a lot of like ocean swimming. You know, I bet you there was a good beach day, a good wow. couple beach days. They use salt water, like uh, pressurized salt water to clean off the molasses. God, some molasses cleaning party. Like how they clean the streets They just let it seep into the streets or do they get like. The f- um, because it was so close to the ocean, most of it had just flown into the harbor. So most yeah. of it was gone. It was the remaining layer of sort of like too dry to move molasses was about curb high and they used um pressurized salt water and probably teams of men with like brooms to move the rest into the ocean or down the drains i I wonder how much like the city had to pay for just cleanup it must have been outrageous like i know the 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 lawsuit and everything that was like expensive but i mean just the cleanup of that must have been outrageous Yeah. yeah i don't know if that was factored into the money that they gave the department of paving yeah, and you're talking about how there's still to this day gla- on the glass of the old buildings with molasses. That's kind of fun. Do you think anybody like goes and like this the toe and uh, where they wanted to drink it, but there's just someone just scrapes it off and like has a little. I don't think so. The tide lines are quite high up. <laughs> we have ladders. 
I don't think so. <laughs> I also don't think that you can actually smell it anymore. I think that that's just a myth. Well, it's a hundred years ago, Jesus. Hey guys, thanks so much for listening. Head on over to our Facebook and Instagram to join in on the conversations about all things unethical. Just search Unethical Podcast. You can also find us on Patreon, where you can get access to all of our super awesome content, uncut videos of our discussions, and early release of all the episodes. We are adding fun stuff all the time, so you should definitely come and check it out. Thanks again. We appreciate all of you. Bam, bam, bam. <laughs>